not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And if you're not starting to invest now and starting to figure out how you can build that into your organization to drive value, then you're behind the eight ball. The, the whole concept of machine learning is the speed to iterate, right? It's helping your teams make better decisions and make those decisions faster. So the people that adopt quickly and drive value, they're only going to iterate and drive improvements at an even faster pace than before. Welcome to Eco Ask Why, a podcast that dives into industrial manufacturing topics and spotlights the heroes that keep America running. I'm your host, Chris Granger, and on this podcast, we do not cover the latest features and benefits on products that come to market. Instead, we focus on advice and insight from the top minds of industry because people and ideas will be how America remains number one in manufacturing in the world. Welcome to Eco Ask Why. Today we have an idea episode and we'll be talking about tackling machine learning and artificial intelligence head on. And I'm excited about it. this. is going to be a fun topic to help us walk through. We'll have Mr. Brandon Mendoza, who is the Director of Sales at Odin Technologies. So welcome, Brandon. Thanks, Chris. Excited to be here. Absolutely. This is a fun one. This is a topic. People think different things about it. It's definitely cutting edge. I'm excited. We haven't really talked about this a lot on Eco Ask Why. Machine learning, artificial intelligence, that could be a gray area for some of our listeners. How would you explain this to someone who's new to manufacturing or maybe new to these topics? Yeah, for anyone in manufacturing, hopefully you realize the abundance of data in manufacturing. There are uh, millions, if not trillions, of, of sensors and, and data being generated every millisecond across manufacturing. And I think that's why machine learning and AI are keen areas of interest for manufacturers right now, because with big data, it becomes a lot of effort to really extract insights from the data around where are there opportunities to improve production and, and go drive the action or prescribe the, the step it takes to achieve those results. And so when you think about machine learning and AI, it's really about creating a digital model to represent physical processes so that you can drive optimization, start to predict things before they occur and prescribe the best action to deliver the best results. Wow. That was a great explanation, Brandon. One of the best I've ever heard, you know, because it, it really can go, and everybody has a different perception of what machine learning and art, artificial intelligence is. For the people out there, there may be some myths floating around or so far as machine learning and, and AI. You know, you get a chance to debunk them here. You know, what, what would they be? What would you like to just say, hey, you may, you may think of this, but this is not really reality. It's more like this. I think first off, it's, there's definitely some myths around time to value, right? I think when, think when people think about machine learning and AI, they often probably think this is a significant endeavor that's going to take me you know, 6, 12, 24 months to produce a model that's going to be predictive and prescriptive and, and I need a massive amount of data. When in reality, depending on the use case and where you're starting, we've been able to generate predictive and prescriptive models as fast as 30 to 60 days. There's some precursors to that around having the right data and the infrastructure to, to make that happen. But if the data is there, you can actually drive value pretty fast in, in several different use cases and really start reaping the benefits quickly. In addition, I think when people think about machine learning and AI, they think, wow, this is, th that sounds complex. I'm worried about my readiness. Do I have the data infrastructure in place? Do I have the data I need? Do I have the skilled resources? Do I have data scientists on my team? And, and I think to think about this differently, yes, there are some foundational elements as far as smart systems, sensors, instrumentation. You need to have some basic infrastructure as far as centralized networks or historians, OPC servers, things to centralize the data. But when it comes to being able to then drive or extract action from the data, you don't necessarily need to have data scientists on hand or somebody who's very adept in, in statistical analysis. The, the point of the solutions is to simplify that and to really focus on extracting the insight or the action from the data so that your teams are more focused on, on using that insight to drive operational improvements versus becoming a data scientist. And so you know, I think it can be a lot simpler than people think. And their readiness, they, 
They don't need to have that infrastructure consistent and established across the entire enterprise. You look at Nestle, for example, they have 450 factories. I'm sure not every factory has the same infrastructure, the same nomenclature, all of that. And so there's ways to tackle it piecemeal and, and to scale, start small and, and scale. And, and lastly, the complexity of the machine learning that's being applied. Some of it's very basic analytics that can drive significant value. For example, what if the machine learning can just tell you where you're running best and where you're running worst? Like that sounds pretty simple, but when you think about the value behind that, there's quite a bit there, right? If you can start to understand hey, this machine is consistently running better, or the shift of this product, and start to you know, extract out why that is and then replicate and, and drive that best practice throughout the organization. It's a way to take something that's pretty simple. Hey, just tell me where I'm performing best and worst. But that's a use case for machine learning. Wow. That was a great explanation, Brandon. A lot of myths you covered there. The 30 to 60 days to time to value really jumped out to me, Brandon. That was awesome. And I love the advice on don't overcomplicate it. It could really be a simple, where, do, where are we running good versus where are we running bad? And focus on that. If you look at an a industry like automotive, could you give us a comparison from an automotive manufacturer as an example on how they're approaching machine learning and artificial intelligence differently? Yeah, I think every industry has different use cases that they're focused on. I think at the end of the day, across manufacturing, the main areas that people are focused on are quality, performance, utilization, workforce productivity, and overall operational agility. And when it comes to automotive, for example, versus food and beverage or pharma, I think they're very focused on cycle time, right? And most of the operations in automotive are more discrete in nature. And therefore, utilization and performance are, are definitely the high areas of focus. They're trying to reduce the amount of unplanned downtime. And, and when machines are scheduled to run, you know, running those as often uh, or as at a highest utilization as possible and, and at, at closest point to target throughput. So often they're using machine learning to do things like predictive maintenance and figure out how to replace tools or, or change over processes and time those perfectly based on the data or use machine learning to uh, understand, again, where they have the best or worst performance across throughput on different parts of their process. But also even in automotive, quality is clearly a key component. So how do they leverage maybe offline quality systems with their process data to create a more predictive quality model so they can allow their operations teams to be more proactive in how they're uh, running their facilities. Very cool. Thank you for that. I mean, so where are you seeing some of these adoptions early taking place that maybe you didn't anticipate? Yeah. You know, I think COVID, for me at least, has surprised me in some ways as far as what industries have been positively or negatively impacted. To give you a couple of examples, the building materials industry, as well as like data infrastructure, so like wire and cable and things like that, have surprisingly gone up uh, significantly. And when you think about it, it makes sense, right? Because people are spending more time at home and therefore people potentially want to buy or build new homes, as well as people are using the internet more than ever at their homes and therefore the need for bandwidth and things like that it has gone up. And so I think that dramatic shift in demand or increase in demand has caused those two industries to look to adopt machine learning and AI to increase capacity. And I think the other reason why you're seeing that is COVID has definitely inserted some market uncertainty, right? Whether your demand is up or down, whether that's going to be a long-term or short-term impact is kind of uncertain. And therefore, for example, in the building materials, if your demand's up right now, but you're, not, you're worried that's not going to be there for six months, 12 months from now, are you going to go out and buy a bunch of new equipment to, to increase your demand? Or are you going to look to adopt technologies that can allow you to take advantage of your current equipment, but drive higher throughputs, better utilization, better quality? And, and that's a more sustainable action that we're seeing manufacturers take right now because of that market uncertainty. That was, that was two great examples. You're right. It's through the roof with, with the pandemic, the building materials, man. You tried to build anything lately? Oh, my gracious. It's just everybody's doing projects. So what about entry points? If you were to, to give some advice to that manufacturer 
out there right now. Are there any good entry points for that you should start looking at from a machine learning or AI standpoint? Yeah. Yeah, I somewhat used a bad example earlier, and it's not necessarily a bad example, but I think when you think about machine learning, the top use case that I think most people think of is predictive maintenance. And I'll be honest, that is not the area that we traditionally recommend starting with customers. Because when you think about machine learning, it all comes down to data and building out an accurate model. Well, in order to build out an accurate model to predict certain behavior or prescribe or optimize, you need enough data to make the model accurate. And when you think about predictive maintenance, the number of, of failures that you have specific to a specific problem might be far and few between. And so your data set might be limited, right? It might take you six months before you have a hundred of the same failure. And therefore it slows the ability of the machine learning technology to build out a, an accurate model that can you know, predict that in advance. We've actually seen much better success and much faster success in performance and quality. So those are our top two use cases for machine learning on how you can drive value the quickest. And I'll just unpack those a little bit. Performance, for example, it's often a goal of manufacturers to say, how do I maximize throughput while maintaining or improving quality? We have an algorithm, for example, called Golden Run that looks at their processes and looks at their production runs and, and automatically extracts out where they maximize throughput while maintaining or improving quality and actually prescribes back the process set points needed to achieve that. Another example is, and I, and I mentioned this earlier, but I'll unpack it a bit further, quality. I think quality gets pretty complex because, you know, depending on the process of the in industry, the amount of inline quality that they have might be limited. For example, most manufacturers don't have inline instrumentation that actually determines whether it's final good or bad product, meaning if it's good or, or scrapped product. It's often end of line or a, an offline test that's performed that determines whether it you know, passes final quality. And the ability to combine both offline quality with inline quality and, and production data is something that machine learning can, can help you sift through faster and be able to build A, a predictive model so you can predict quality issues before they occur or, or predict scrap, for example. If, if you're running a production run and your average scrap is 5%, but you range from 2 to 10%, if you don't know until after you've completed the order on how much scrap you've produced, how does that operator know whether they're going to overshoot or undershoot their, their current production? So being able to take that offline data and build a predictive scrap model would allow that operator to understand, am I producing more or less scrap than I normally do? And therefore, do I need to produce for a longer or less period of time? Wow. Okay. That really helps. So, because you're right, I think initially people go straight to that predictive model. But with that, you're all over it. That's a limited data set and you may not see that return that you're needing. The performance and quality, that sounds like that, what'd you call it? The golden run? Was that what you called that? I did, and you, you'll hear terms like golden batch, golden run, but it's really about finding that ideal recipe and using the machine learning to, to help you identify that. And, it, and sometimes it's as simple as looking at your best of best and your worst of worst when it comes to analyzing your production lines and allowing the machine learning to just extract out where you perform best. Exactly, exactly. And then from a quality standpoint, the, the way you tied it together with that, you call it the inline process, getting that so I, and make sure I'm on the same page. The inline process data, getting the data as the process is happening versus just looking in the rear view when it's done and making decisions and, and making more in the moment decisions for optimization is, am I on the right path or, or help me if I'm off? Yeah. And I'll just clarify a bit further. So again, some manufacturers have some inline quality, but I would say most don't have inline quality that actually determines final good or bad quality. Most of the time it's an offline test that happens after the fact that determines good or bad quality. And so what you can do with machine learning is leverage the offline quality combined with the inline quality and other process data to build a predictive model so that 
you're not looking in the rear view mirror and finding out after the production run, I created 5% more scrap than I normally do. Like when you have that predictive model, you can then stream that in real time and alert or identify to various personnel, whether things are operating below or, or above performance. You know, if there's a certain quality KPI that you have to keep in upper and lower limits, instead of looking in the rear mirror, you can use that predictive quality to start to be proactive on controlling the process and making sure you're not producing more scrap than you want to. That tied it all together. Perfect example. Wait, thank you for bringing me out of the weeds. <laughs> Sorry about that. But I mean, that was a great explanation. It, it painted the complete picture for me. Now, for someone who wants to learn more and they're really interested, they want to sharpen their skills in these areas, where would you point them? Yeah, I mean, there's several companies that have machine learning technologies, whether it's the cloud providers and GCP, Microsoft, Amazon, all the way down to the, the niche players like Odin that are very specialized in, in manufacturing and, and driving improvements there. All of these folks are continuously ho hosting webinars. So I would, I would look to take advantage of those with our COVID environment. There's not as many trade shows, right? So online webinars and, and virtual panels where people are discussing AI and machine learning and how it's applied to, mach to manufacturing would be the first place that I'd recommend. I'm sure like this podcast, there's uh, probably some podcasts out there that are solely focused on AI. I don't know any off the top of my head, but I'm sure with a quick Google search, we could find some top ones. And I think it's interesting to look at ones that are maybe generic outside of manufacturing because there's probably some parallels, but also look at ones that are maybe more focused on manufacturing. And then lastly, I actually just got done, uh, I took a course at MIT called Smart Manufacturing, Shifting from Dynamic Manufacturing. And it's really around smart manufacturing principles and leveraging advanced analytics and machine learning. And MIT is a, a great institution, but I'm sure there's several others out there that are offering similar courses. So that's definitely a more in-depth commitment. But if you're looking to learn a lot in an area to consider. Right. No doubt. And we can even link in, in the show notes for our listeners if they want to check that out. So thank you for those for that insight on, on, on where to go, how to learn. Let's talk about the who for a minute. Who would typically lead the evaluation, integrating, things like that from machine learning and AI in the manufacturing plant? Yeah, it definitely depends. I think it's similar to when you think about who's leading digital transformation and smart manufacturing as a whole, which we know is a, a cross-functional team, typically across engineering, IT, operations, but even into finance and HR. But as far as who's the, the key lead for AI and machine learning in particular, it often comes down to the engineering team. And I would say like continuous improvement or, or process engineering teams, because these are the folks that are already looking to optimize their process to the fullest level and, and take advantage of data and SPC and other things. And so uh, these are people that are used to this to a certain extent and and can more quickly understand and apply the technology. Some manufacturers have data science teams, but not everyone has that luxury. If you don't have data science teams, look to leverage solutions that are more turnkey, where they're doing the data science for you. Smart manufacturing as a service, for example. But yeah, those are the, typically the teams that we're seeing lead it. Uh, it often requires help from your IT teams, right? Data is a big part of this. So whether it's your data infrastructure, or even I saw a customer recently that had a, a data governance team which I thought was pretty interesting, where they're starting to define standards around who owns data, who has access to data, what data do they need, what systems are connected, things like that. Um, so that would be another thing that I would encourage folks to think about is, you know, should you have a data governance team within your organization? I guess also you have to, for our listeners out there that may be in the moment, in the facilities working, got any headwinds that you'd like to point out that could exist when you start implementing a lot of these solutions. And just with your experience, Brandon, I'm sure you, you could offer a lot of, of guidance in, in that area. So any advice there? Yeah, I think in general, a trend I'm noticing within IoT platforms is a lot of them are, are a great platform, but they're often a, a toolbox, meaning, hey, this is a platform that you can then 
you know, build upon and a lot of them are becoming drag and drop, zero code, low code um, environments. But the reality is they require significant development. And in my experience, you end up, you know, paying two to five X the, the SaaS cost, for example, to, to start generating ROI and delivering value. And, and sometimes it takes, you know, six to 12 months before you're delivering that value and you end up with something that's much more custom and, and difficult to scale. I would look to leverage systems that are more turnkey, meaning out of the box, the system is providing insights. It has built-in data taxonomies, built-in visualizations, built-in analytics and machine learning so that your teams are more focused on using the insights from the tool versus building out that custom experience. And that way your time to value can be greatly reduced where in 60 to 90 days, you'll have a clear idea of of whether it makes sense to continue to invest. I think in general, it also requires cross-functional teams from an execution standpoint, as we talked to on the last one. Uh, but then lastly, I would say focus on driving adoption. And whenever you're trying to implement a new technology, nobody likes change. And so it's important to, again, get buy-in on the why behind the project and make it very clear to folks how it's going to change their role and how it's going to improve it. If they see the technology as a burden to their job, they're probably not going to welcome it. But if they see it as something that, you know, is integral to making them more productive in their role, then, you know, I'm guessing they would embrace it with open arms. Yeah. We've got to win those advocates, right? Mm Mm-hmm. Absolutely. This is this has been a fun conversation, Brandon. A lot of insights you brought for sure. And we call it Eco S Y. We wrap up with the why every time. So why is embracing machine learning and artificial intelligence important for any industry out there to consider through their evolution? Yeah. I like analogies. I'm gonna answer this one with an analogy. When you think about autonomous vehicles, I don't think there's anybody out there that's saying is autonomous vehicles, are they going to happen? I think everyone's convinced they are going to happen. And it's not a matter of if, but a matter of when. And therefore, if you look at automotive companies, they've been investing in autonomous technology for several years now, and they're continuing to do so, even though you can't have an autonomous vehicle operating on the road today. So same thing for manufacturing. Machine learning, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And if you're not starting to invest now and starting to figure out how you can build that into your organization to drive value, then you're behind the eight ball. I think McKinsey just released a report the other day that the early adopters will be reaping ROI at 122% those that are lagging. Because again, the, the whole concept of machine learning is the speed to iterate, right? It's helping your teams make better decisions and make those decisions faster. The people that adopt quickly and drive value, they're only going to iterate and drive improvements at an even faster pace than before. Right. Well, Brandon, this has been a wonderful episode. Thank you so much for taking the time with us on EcoSY. A lot of insight, a lot of good nuggets for our listeners that may be new to machine learning or artificial intelligence. So thank you for taking the time with us today. Appreciate it, Chris. Thanks for having me on. Thank you for listening to EcoSY. This show is supported ad-free by Electrical Equipment Company. ECO is redefining the expectations of an electrical distributor by placing people and ideas before products. Please subscribe and share with your colleagues and friends. Also, leave comments, feedback, and any new topics that you would like to hear. To learn more or to share your insights, visit ecosy.com. That's E-E-C-O-A-S-K-S-W-H-Y.com.